Uh, welcome again to everyone, especially those who are joining us for the very first time. Um, it is an absolute joy to have all of you, um, even though we're seeing one another from blocks on the screen, um, it is a privilege to be fellowshipping with one another this Sunday morning. We do long for and hope to soon gather physically when we can be in one another's spaces, um, but we are um, eternally grateful for technology and the platforms that we have for us to meet and gather like this on a Sunday morning. Um, a little bit about us. Um, we are Fellowship City. Fellowship City is part of the Fellowship Church movement. We are a gospel-centered, disciple-making, and transcultural family who want to see the world awakened to the wonder of God and his transcultural church. We are a fellowship group in the heart of Centurion. So let's double click that a little bit. What do we mean by gospel centered? We mean a life centered and saturated around the truth of the perfect birth, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and return of Jesus Christ, affirming him as Lord and savior. We find salvation, meaning, purpose, and everlasting life in Jesus Christ alone. What do we mean when we say disciple making? We are called to follow Jesus and to have our lives transformed by him. We are sent to share his love and make disciples who make disciples. Transcultural, what do we mean when we say transcultural? Transcultural means having a view of community that reflects, embraces, and enjoys the diversity of its context. And by the power of the gospel, transcends it to form one new community in Christ. Well, I'm going to lay out the land for our time together. Um, I would be the assistant coach, but a playing coach as well. I'll be laying the land of how we're going to transition through the different, the different segments of today. Um, I will be mentioning some of the people that are playing alongside us. Um, but as we've spoken about what it means to be transcultural, what does it actually look like? Um, I think this this looks like a gospel-centered, disciple-making and transcultural family consisting of missional communities of people who are committed to living life on life, life in community and life on mission. Life on mission is key here for that will always be our evangelistic and missional thrust that keeps us outward focused. And because of that, it means we all play. Um, it means God has uniquely gifted us in different ways so that we're knitted together and all work together to be the body of Christ. And just as assistant coach, um, as I lay out this, this morning for us, I'll be on the sidelines cheering. I'll be jumping on, catching a pass and passing it back. Um, I will be amening, clicking, and praising Jesus on the sideline with us together. Um, so this is how the lay of the land will be this morning. I will be first handing off a swift pass to Shiami, who will be praying for us. Shiami, would you give us a, a wave there, there, Shiami? Uh, then I will, she, I'll be, she, Shiami will be passing it back to me. I'll be, I'll be keeping possession of the ball as Clarissa and I do a one-two. Clarissa will be moving us into breakout rooms, and this will be a great time of deeper fellowship in the middle of our service. This is a great time for us to get to know one another better, um, to chat through a question or two. So at that time, I'll be giving us a lay of the land for how we're going to do that, uh, but that will be the next segment. Um, then immediately after we jump out of, uh, Clarissa, can you give us a wave there? I see Clarissa is still busy there. Okay, you will, you will see a wave from Clarissa when that segment starts. Um, after that segment, we will be returning from breakout rooms and immediately Meryl will be leading us in a time of praise and worship. Meryl, can you give us a wave? There's Meryl. And then Reino will be taking the ball from there from a swift back pass from Meryl. Um, and Reino will be leading us in a time of God's word. Um, after that, we will have a time of reflection um, where Clarissa will again move us into breakout rooms so that we can reflect on God's word. Um, then Mari will be praying for us. Is Mari there for a wave? Uh, don't. Oh, there's, there's Mari with a wave. So Mari will be leading us uh, for prayer as we end our time together. Then Arena will send, out, send us out with a good word, with a benediction. 
Um, so at this point, um, I see Shiam is ready. Um, Shiam is ready to pray for us, and I'll just give that pass to Shiam. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Petulio. Uh, let's 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 uh, pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we approach your throne of grace this morning, O oh Father God, with thankfulness and thanksgiving in our hearts. But of our creation, this has been a long time coming, O oh Father. It has been a vision, O oh Father God, that you have placed in our leaders' hearts. Here it is, O oh Father God, on this day, O oh Father God, that that seed that you have planted in their hearts is germinating, O oh Father God, into a tree, O oh Father God, that will hopefully give life, O oh Father God, to those that are lifeless, O oh Father. It will give courage, O oh Father God, to those that are despondent, O oh Father God. So we come to you this wonderful morning, O oh Father God, to thank you, Father God, for the number of years and days and meetings that we have had to go through, O oh Father God, in preparation of our creation for this day, O oh Father God. We pray, O oh Father God, that as we, as we engage and begin, O oh Father God, this journey, Lord of all creation, may you come with us. Father God, may you go before us, O oh Father God, and lead the way, O oh Father God. May you help us, O oh Father God, not to, for even once, O oh Father God, think that all this is happening because of our abilities, O oh Father God. But that we acknowledge, O oh Father God, that it is happening because of who you are, O oh Father God, because you've ordained the Lord of all creation, because you've called it forth, O oh Father God. And we pray, O Lord of all creation, that may you help us, O oh Father God, along the way, O oh Father God, that we may not move, O oh Father God, of our own accord, O Lord of all creation, but that we may move only when you say move, O Father God, that we may act only when you say act, O Father God, that whatever decisions we make, O Father God, are decisions, O Lord of all creation, that are ordained by you, O Father God. We thank you, Father God, for your faithfulness thus far, O Father God. We say Ebenezer, Lord of all creation, for what you have taken us through, O oh Father God. Lord, you have seen our tomorrows, O oh Father God. Guide us, O oh Father God, that you may be able to have a brighter tomorrow, O oh Father God. A tomorrow, O oh Father God, that only shines your light, O oh Lord of all creation. A tomorrow only, Father God, that shows and cares for those that feel uncared for, O oh Father God. A tomorrow, O oh Father God, that loves those that feel unloved, O oh Father God. A tomorrow, O oh Father God, that cherish all, O oh Father God, from various uh, backgrounds, O oh Father God, still, that when they come in communion with us, O oh Father God, that they feel your presence. And when they come into communion with us, O oh Father God, that they feel your love, O oh Father God. For we do not do this, O oh Father God, for our own sake, O oh Father God. We do this, O oh Father God, because we believe that you have called us and we give the reins to you, O oh Father God, to say, Lord, guide us. Lord, lead us, O oh Father God. May we act only in your ways, O oh Father God. May we act only, O oh Father God, as you will, O oh Father God. May we showcase your will, O oh Father God. May we marvel in your love and grace. May we portray, O oh Father God, your heart in all that we do, O oh Father God. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we say, Lord of all creation, as we begin this service, O oh Father, Go before us, guide us, O Lord of all creation, and lead us into your heart, into your court, O Father. We pray this in the name of our Father, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you, Shia. I mean, I think that is a prayer of our hearts that God would continue to lead us, to lead us not only in the service in, in weeks and months and years to come as we seek to reach the city of Centurion. Amen, amen, and amen. Um, Clarissa didn't give us a wave. Uh, we're going to move into that segment. So I'll ask Clarissa to give us a wave. There, there's Clarissa. So Clarissa will be moving us into breakout rooms. So this will be a great time of deeper fellowship um, in the middle of our service, just to get to know one another better, um, answer a question. In a moment, I'm going to give us a question. But before I do that, uh, just some ground rules of how we're going to navigate this. So when you're in the breakout rooms, um, two minutes to go, two minutes before the end of time, you will get a broadcast message that will tell you that in two minutes you will be automatically moved so all the breakout rooms will be closed you do not need to click you do not need to initiate everything everyone will move back into the one room so we will give you grace we don't want to cut off conversations but rather give you that two minutes to know that this is going to happen so if you don't know one another as well um, that's a great time to introduce yourself um, share a little bit about yourself and then get to the question so the question is what do you love doing with other people and why? So what do you love about doing, what do you love doing with other people and why? Um, so in a moment, Clarissa is going to throw us in the breakout rooms. Um, enjoy this time, get to know one another better, chat through the question.
All right. Hi, everyone. I'm so excited about um, just what we're doing and finally having a chance. We're going to sing two songs today. Um, the one is Wahamba Nati, and it's a song of thanksgiving of how God has walked with us. The words are up there. You will see them. Um, uh, yeah, so it's a song, a song of thanksgiving. Um, I obviously don't have a full band here. So clap, sing, dance, um, and let's just give praise. Thank you, God, for your amazing grace. God, grace that covered us, Lord, and um, grace that is so good to us. Amazing grace, how sweet the red like me. Thank you. 
notice that we've got two angles in the Shukievich house this morning. So not only did Meryl lead worship for us, she actually also is hosting some people. Hey, there's Meryl back on the other Shukievich frame. So thank you so much uh, for leading us in that time. It was good to say thank you. It's good to say thank you that Jesus has journeyed with us. And it's obviously also good to just be bathed in his grace and the meaning of it for us. So guys, I have the privilege this morning of uh, preaching the word and of taking us through uh, a portion of the Bible that I believe is very, very meaningful full for us and very timely uh, where we are at the moment as a church. So let me just share my screen here quickly with you and uh, just put the theme out that we are going to be looking at today. There we go. The church is a family. That is our title for today. And there's a really short uh, little description. The church is a family. That's a fact. We believe that we are all adopted into this family by God's grace. That's also really important. We want to live like a healthy, unified family. So the church is a family. I am going to share my screen every now and then just to show you uh, either illustrations or to show you some scripture. But while I'm actually not talking about something that is on a slide, I shall stop sharing my screen. So you guys will have to navigate with me from Zoom to PowerPoint and then from PowerPoint back to Zoom. So two loaded words, right? Church and family. And I think the church is a family is also a loaded phrase because these two words have such a wide variety of meaning 
in this time that we're living. Now, here's what I want you to know this morning. This is something that we do believe in as a church. And we believe in it because it's biblical. Okay, So the word family is like a golden thread all the way through the Old Testament. And it is to be found in a profound way in the New Testament. And not only is it something we believe in because it's biblical, it's something we believe in because we believe that this is good news to the world we live in. We believe that the world needs to hear this at this moment in time. We live in a world that is becoming increasingly separated from one another. It's becoming increasingly isolated. People kind of either live in their own heads or in their own social media accounts. We often hear from people, especially in the middle class or even in the younger generation, that the hustle is real. There's so many things that we ought to do every week. And uh, somehow community is always the last priority. And I believe personally, this is just a word from me, that this will be one of our best tools for evangelism as this new church starting in Centurion and the surrounds. I believe inviting someone into a group of people that live together like a family is the best evangelism tool. Well, one of the best evangelism tools we can have. Because you've got good news to this person, that good news has implications, and that means that this person is becoming part of a new group, a new family. So how would it be if you can actually invite that person into an actual family made up of actual people actually living together as a Christian New Testament family? So just a quick note, over the next six weeks, we are going to spend time every Sunday with a really short key statement or key message like this. So this is one of the things that we believe in. That's one of the contributions we want to make as a church plant to this area of Centurion. And every week for the next six weeks, we'll take one of them and we'll explain them, we'll clarify them, and we'll give some opportunity to engage with them. So we have one teaching text today, but I will cover a little bit of a broader section of the Bible. And I would like to just put that on the table now at this point. It's found in the book of Acts. It's chapter 2, it's verses 42 to 47. I am going to put that up on the screen for us. I'm going to ask Annika, she's part of the group in Francois and Ilana's house at this moment, to just read the text for us. And then after she's read the text to us, I will do a prayer for us and we'll slide into the sermon. So Annika, thank you so much for being willing to read us the text. Will you please read to us Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Sure. So, hi, family. Let's read. Um, so, the scripture reads like this. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Lord Jesus, we've acknowledged that this church is your church, that you are the head of it, that you have called it into being, and that we are willing to do this with you, that we are willing to serve for your kingdom's purposes, that we are willing to be used by you. We've sung about your grace. We've said our words of thanks. We've had a time of fellowship, uh, which is always meaningful for us, that we can look another image bearer of you in the eye and then talk about life. And it's at this point, Lord Jesus, that I want to ask that your word would seep deeply into our hearts, that your spirit will be busy inside of us as we look at the word, that you will open up a new imagination for the Christian life to us, that you would bind us together and unify us as family as we look at this piece of scripture, and that you would uh, really enlighten our thoughts as we engage with this. I'm very aware, Lord Jesus, of the last six days and everything that many of us have to go through. I'm very aware of the fact that there's probably a mammoth six days lying ahead of us as well. Please make us calm now. Have us focus on your word. Have us engage with one another so that it will be edifying to us and focus our thoughts 
on your good news. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Okay, so for now, I'm just going to nip out of PowerPoint, and uh, then I'll bring you guys back once we look at verse 41 of Acts chapter 2. So at first glance, guys, if you look at this portion of scripture that we just read, you'll see three things in the teaching text. The one is who this family was, is described to us. What they did together as a family is described to us. And what this meant to other people around them is also described to us. Now, normally, when I preach a sermon or when we make a sermon, we would kind of follow the same recipe, right? And the recipe is this. Guys, here's what the text says. Here's what it means. And therefore, if you call yourself a Christian or a believer, this is what you ought to do. This is the response that this text asks of you. And that would probably take me somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes. Now, I believe that the platform we are in now, physical, digital, to do, fidgetal, I believe that the platform asks just for a different approach. So I can't see myself preaching to you now for the next 30 to 45 minutes and covering all three of those steps. I did do deep study of this piece of scripture, and I do have um, a good understanding of the text, but I would actually like us to engage around this and specifically to speak about what it is that this text asks of us. What it is that, or, or in which way does this text actually apply to us, okay? So let me state the end goal. Here's where I want to land with this sermon. Then I'll do, here's what the text says and here's what it means. And then after that, guys, here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a break. You can mute your mic and turn off your camera for five minutes. Go and get yourself a fresh brew or do whatever needs to be done in your house or around the people where you are at. And then we, when we come back, we're going to take a solid time of reflection. We're going to spend that time in breakout rooms again. We kept the breakout rooms almost the same. We just made a couple of changes. And in the breakout rooms, we'll have some solid discussion about what I just said. And after the breakout rooms, we'll be back in the big room where we will either give feedback or have the ability to ask some questions. So I believe that that's a better way of engaging the word, especially because we are still a small-ish group, and that's what we are going to do today. So like I said, the end goal is really easy, and that is to state that the church is family, but even more than that, for us to explore what did this family do in the New Testament, and what did that mean to other people around this family, and then to chat about what this means to us. So thank you, Annika, for reading the teaching text to us. Let me just answer the question, how did we get here, right? Because we jumped into the biblical story in the New Testament after thousands of years of history and read a portion of scripture that describes a really small group of people. Well, not really small. I mean, there were 3,000 at that point, but that describes the lives of 3,000 people 2,000 years ago, right? So it took some doing to get there. Let me just flash through them. And I don't have a slide for each one because I rather prefer looking at you guys on a grid and seeing your faces as I preach instead of just looking at a slide and not really knowing what the vibe is on the other side of the screen. So in Matthew 28 verse 19, it's a well-known verse, Jesus says to his disciples, this is what I want you to do. And the main charge is go. You guys are sent. And then Jesus says, as you go, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to baptize people. I want, I want you to draw them into the community of people. And I want you to teach them my ways. So that's a really important marker in the New Testament. After salvation, after the resurrection, uh, just before Jesus' ascension, he gives this charge to his disciples. In Acts chapter 1, that's a book written by a man called Luke, he recounts this story, and then he has this little description in verses 1 to 5, where the disciples had to wait. So they were sent, and they were charged, but before they started their work, they had to wait for something to happen to them. And then Luke carries on in Acts chapter 1 to, says that this, to say that this thing they had to wait for is for the Holy Spirit to be poured out over them. So here's your charge. That's what you ought to do. Hang on a second before you start. Uh, I need to empower you to do this by the Spirit. And then in Acts chapter 2, in the beginning, we read about this story. So the thing that was said has to happen first actually 
happen. We read this phenomenal story of the Holy Spirit being poured out over all believers. Right after that happens, Peter speaks. And not actually only Peter, but everyone in the church starts speaking. They've got good news. They've got a message. That good news and that message is for all people. And as this good news and message is for all people, the way that the message gets transmitted or translated is by way of speaking. And then we see after Peter's first sermon, there is phenomenal success. And 3,000 people actually come to faith. Guys, can you imagine if we were on Zoom today and I preached the first sermon for Fellowship City and 3,000 people came onto the call saying, hey, guys, uh, I'm in. Where should I go? I mean, there's just no infrastructure or no process or no Google form, really, that could scoop that colossal amount of people. And that is what happened in the time of the New Testament after Peter's sermon. And then we read Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47, that we just looked at. And here's a, a brief summary of this piece of scripture. It's describing to us that the lives of the people, the ones who received the word through this verbal telling by Peter, bore witness. So there's a little description, a witness that comes from the lives of these people. And what we see, in short, in this portion of scripture, is that they adopted new rhythms, they lived a common life, and it was all formed around new habits. And as the story of the New Testament continues, we also see that people actually found this bizarre. It's weird to think how people could all be part of this one colossal family and get along so well and live together in these new rhythms and practice these new habits. Now, who were these people? That's really important for us to just answer the very, very first question. Who were the people spoken of in this portion of scripture? I just want to flip back to one verse really quickly. And that's the verse just prior to this portion of scripture. Those who received his word were baptized and they now, and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. So those who received the word and those who were baptized. That's the people we're talking about here. That's the family described in Acts chapter 2, verses uh, 42 to 47. Okay, now. What did they do? Let me just fly over this really quickly, because I think we need to get a grip on it. And I want us to discuss this a little bit more when we are together in our breakout rooms. If you look back at the portion of scripture, what they did was they devoted themselves to something. They devoted themselves to something. Now, devoted doesn't necessarily only mean devotions, right? In the Christian subculture, people would say stuff like, Oof, I'm back to doing some really deep devotions, or I had some wonderful devotions this morning. And we pretend as if the word devotion only means personal discipline of me doing something repetitively. But that's actually not what this word entails. What this word means in the Greek language and in the context of the New Testament is being committed to doing something over and over and over again. You are devoted to something if you keep on repeating it in your life. Think of something really simple like brushing your teeth. I uh, would imagine that all of us think it's a good idea to brush your teeth. It's a healthy rhythm to have. But you can't be convicted that it's a good idea and then you only do it once and then say, I am devoted to brushing my teeth. That's just not how it works. You need to do it every single day to reap the benefits of having good dental hygiene. Or think of running, okay, just as a general exercise for everyone to do. If you are convicted or convinced that running is a good idea or a good habit to have, then you ought to repeat it if you really want to be a devoted runner. So we prioritize it because we are convicted of the fact that it's important. So they were devoted. And they were devoted to four things. And all four in this portion of scripture are actually listed in verses 42. So it gives us the stuff that they were devoted to, and then it describes the effect of this stuff that they devoted themselves to. So let's just fly through them real quick. On the one hand, it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. And for them to be devoted to the apostles' teaching, they had to gather. 
And as we know from the New Testament, they gathered in different places, exactly like we do today. They simply just didn't have the venue to fit all 3,000 people into the same venue at the same time, even though they did go to spaces where there were bigger groups of people, and they also went to spaces where there were smaller groups of people, and that was in their homes. And we read in the scripture what they did there was they learned. This group of people was a learning community. That's actually what the word disciple means. I don't know if you know that. The Greek word is mathetes. It actually means learner. Someone learning something. Now, it's interesting that Luke lists the apostles' teaching first. I think he listed the apostles' teaching first because that helps them to understand what they are learning is about who they are worshiping. Right? So they're called into a new family to worship this God that brought all these people together in his family. So who is he? And discovering who he is is done by being devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, if you can just imagine, back in the book of Acts, the apostles actually were still alive. Right? So real people who knew Jesus in the flesh, who heard his words, who saw all his signs and wonders, who could then say to other people, this is what he said to us. This is what he did while we were, while we were with him. And this is what he commanded us to do. Right? So that's the main message of the apostles. So they helped the people to understand that if the gospel was true, then what does it mean for our lives? Now, for us today, as believers 2,000 years after the New Testament, the apostles' teaching come to us in the form of the Bible. So we have a nicely bound up, uh, well, or downloaded app if you want to, book consisting of 66 other books divided into two parts, the first part and the second part, the Old and the New Testament. And it's our job to study it. It's our job to learn from it. And it's our job to allow it to seep into every little crack and part of our lives. And this requires a daily devotion to the apostles' teaching. Let me, go, let me show you a picture real quick. Um, so this is a picture that has got a fond memory of my younger years. So top left, you see a guy uh, ripping it up on Church Square on a skateboard. Top right, you see the probably the most well-known skateboarder in the history of the universe, and that's Tony Hawk. I mean, do you guys see the crowd of people coming to see what it's like if Tony Hawk takes on a half pipe? And then down in the middle is a picture of myself and one of my mates. No, I'm joking. That's actually not me, uh, but that was me earlier in my life. I really, really loved skateboarding. Now, when I started liking skateboarding, it was like a total life overhaul, a total new imagination of what I could be like and who I could be, right? On the one hand, I was the guy top left. I mean, every single staircase you saw was a staircase that you could ollie from or do a little pop from. Every single handrail or curb I saw was something that you could either grind or slide. Anything that had an angle of like more than 10 or 15 degrees was something that you could do some big air from. And I was Tony Hawk crazy, like Tony Hawk shoes, Tony Hawk birdhouse skateboard, Tony Hawk merchandise, Tony Hawk computer games, Tony Hawk joystick, like Tony Hawk everything, even though I was actually on the level of these two gentlemen down here right? Beginner skateboarder, not actually knowing how to do it, but it changed my whole imagination for my whole life. And I prioritized skateboarding. Every single second that I could go out on my deck, I did it. Every time I achieved something like a four or a five brick air, I would add another brick, go six, go seven, go eight, go 10, until I eventually wrote off my shin. But that's a story for a different day. I actually do have the scar to show it. But like skateboarding took a hold of my whole imagination. Being part of God's newly created family took hold of the early church's imagination. It's like a new identity that you take on. It's a new lens that you look at the world through. It's a new priority you have. It's something that just instantly becomes the most important thing in your life. And I think that's why the apostles' teachings top the list, because that was the way that the people could understand what this actually means to me.
I'll show you guys another image in only a few minutes. Let me look at the other three. They also devoted themselves to fellowship. Now, guys, fellowship for us might mean an elbow greeting and a quick coffee. But fellowship in the New Testament actually meant a commitment to share everything you have with the people in your presence who you are in relationship with. The Greek word is koinonia. You might have seen it on a gift that someone gave you that they bought in Kung books for Christmas. You know, Christian art gifts, always a classic amongst the church. You might have seen the word koinonia. Now, koinonia means fellowship. Koinonia means sharing. Now, you know just as well as I do that if you allow people into your space, if you do life with other people, if you practice hobbies with people, if you work with people, even if you live with people, if you worship with people, eventually you start sharing more and more and more and more of yourself. That is what fellowship is. And we'll see in this portion of scripture that it was not only sharing of themselves, it was actually sharing of their things. Dude, do you need clothes? I have some. Let me give some to you. Do you need a bread? I've got two. You have none. Let me give you one. And in that way, they believed that they had to share everything with one another. Why? Because they were family. It's really easy, right? My brother calls me now and he's like, hey, dude, can I borrow your car? Can I borrow your bicycle? Or can I borrow whatever from you? My first instinct will be, yes, absolutely, mate. Of course. Why? Because he's my brother and I know him and I trust him and we do life together and he's part of my family. And in the same way, I think it should also be in church that we get to know each other through the course of fellowship in such a deep way that this reaction comes naturally for us. Then one of my favorite activities, luckily, is what the church devoted themselves to in the New Testament. And that is eating, guys. Come on now. We actually plotted this service at 1030 so that all of you would be really hungry at 12 and actually break bread together. That's a very lame joke, but I just wanted to put that out there at least. So the, they committed themselves to the breaking of bread, to actually eating together. And you guys know that once you sit down around a table and you look someone else in the eye and you start eating and you start savoring what is in front of you, you start sharing more of yourself. Marie and I were actually in macro yesterday. I wasn't planning on telling the story, but let me tell the story now. And we were looking for new dining chairs for our dining table. And as we sat down on them, we had many sales representatives around us going, so is this the one you want? Is that the one you want? Do you want the armrest? Not the armrest. Do you want the, the one with the steel legs or the one with the plastic legs? Would you like a cushion with that? I mean, we had a lot of people wanting to help us. And we just sat there. And at one point I said to Marie, I'm just sitting because I need to imagine sitting on this chair for two and a half or three hours. And then she went, that's a really good point. And then I went, absolutely. Because that's what happens when you sit and you scoff and you have some food, right? You linger and you linger and you linger. You guys know that moment where the little sauce that was still left on the plate actually becomes sticky and dry. That's how long you've sat there after your dinner. Like that's what they committed themselves to. They committed to breaking bread together and to having communion while they do it. So not only having a good meal, not only having good chats, but also going, let's remember the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's remember his body being broken for us. Let's remember his blood being shed for us. We have some cause for celebration. Let's celebrate together. And the last thing they committed themselves to was the prayers. Now, at this point in the story of the book of Acts, most believers had a solid, solid Jewish background. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but the Jewish community or the Jewish faith has a long, long and very deep tradition of prayer. Praying specific prayers at specific times with specific people in specific seasons. Why? Most Christians might react to that and go, oh, that sounds way too formal or religious. I would like to make a case to say that if your whole life is drenched in prayer, like the Jewish community's life, then you never, ever lose out of sight who God is. And you never lose out of sight the experience of actually connecting with him in a very personal way and speaking to him. Now, if you are a growing Christian or even a maturing Christian, a new Christian, or you might not be a Christian at all, then the way into the family of God is by taking on these practices and repeating them with other people until you understand them and until you see the growth in it. That's what this family did together. So this family came into being through the preaching of the word. They received the word. They were baptized. They were put together and they just started learning. And as they learned, they started being together. 
as they were together, they started chowing food. And as they were chowing food, they were praying. And all of a sudden, we read about a movement that started with 12 people or 120 people, if you want to, in an upper room that led to literally billions of people in this world we're living today calling themselves Christians. Because a family of people lived in this really compelling way. Now, I just want to ask the question to the screen, and that is, what will happen if we have a group of people in and around Centurion doing this together? That, that's a question I have. What would happen if we have a group of people in and around Centurion doing this together? I believe that the world will be awakened here where we live to the beautiful truth of the gospel and also be awakened to God's transcultural family. That's something that Lissacho described a little bit earlier. Now, you might listen to me and go, Rhino, great, dude, wonderful exposition. That sounds like stuff for the pros. Don't have time for that. I don't know if I have capacity for it. I'm only just a sinful human being. I really struggle to actually follow Jesus uh, faithfully in my own life. Let me just debunk one of the biggest lies and myths in the Christian community. And that is that you need to be a World Cup professional Christian to actually be called a disciple. That is not the truth. Let me show you a picture. So we have uh, the World Cup winning squad of uh, the last World Cup we had, which was France. There we go. I mean, these guys are top-notch, best in the world, perfectly chosen, skilled in their position, and that's why they are the best team in the world at this point. You don't have to be this. No Christian has to be this to be called a disciple, and no Christian has to be this to be part of God's family. For some reason, in a church country like South Africa, we always feel like there's higher ranker individuals and kind of low ranking individuals, right? There's the people who always seem to have it together. And there's the people who always seem to either not have anything together or who seem to live really broken lives. We can't have that distinction. In the Bible, it's simple. The moment you pledge your faith, you become a disciple. And the moment you become a disciple, you become part of God's family. And the moment you become part of God's family, you start living as family with other people repeating these practices. So what will we do as Fellowship City? And I'll land here and then we'll go into our breakouts. We will gather people together and we will teach them because that's what the family of God did. We will facilitate spaces for fellowship, exactly like we did today, both physical and digital, because that's what the family of God did in the New Testament. We will get people to take communion and to break bread, right? So this will be eating church. Welcome, guys, to eating church. And we will teach people how to pray. And we will teach people how to worship. Because that's what this family of God devoted themselves to. Okay. So what now? Therefore, Christian, this is what you should do. This is something that we are going to discuss in our breakout rooms now. So the big groups uh, in the Shukievich house with Meryl and Curry, they won't be in a breakout room on Zoom. And uh, the group that is in front of Ilana's house, they also won't be in a breakout room on Zoom. The rest of us will be put back into breakout rooms. Guys, I'm going to ask my wife, Marie, to do a prayer for us now. To just cover everything we said to, to one another, everything that was spoken about in prayer. After that, I'm just going to give you like five sentences of practical uh, logistics for the next couple of weeks. And then I'll end us off by reading a couple of verses from the book of Ephesians. And that will be us. So love, thank you so much for praying for us. Okay. Hi everyone. Okay, let's close our eyes. Father, thank you so much for this unbelievable privilege that we have to do church together this morning. It's not perfect, like Lisa also just said. It's not the perfect circumstances that we would have wanted, but we are here and mm. we are worshiping you and we are celebrating mm. this unbelievable journey that we have um, started. And even though it has been quite a few months and a, actually a few years, thank you that we are here. Thank you that we can invite people into this space and share your love with one another. Mm -hmm. Thank you that we can do fellowship together. 
um, once again, not perfect, but we are doing it. Mm. And thank you that we can do it with one another, mm. that we can love on one another, that we can trust one another. Mm. Well, thank you so much that we have this opportunity to be able to build your kingdom. Thank you that we are able to do so with brothers and sisters that we, we know well, that we don't know well, and some that are just um, strangers that are visiting today, mm. maybe, Lord. Thank you that we are able to make your name glorified. And thank you that you are here mm. in the midst of us. Mm. And thank you that you are blessing us, Lord. Mm. Um, I think thankfulness is probably the massive, massive word on my mind today. And we are so, mm. so thankful to you for making mm. this happen. There have been glitches along the way, but you have made us strong. You have um, held up our arms mm. and we are able to do this now, Lord. Thank you for every single person on the screen today. Thank you for everyone who is also joining us um, in spirit. Well, thank you that you... Mm. Um, have made us to do this. Thank mm. you that you are here. And thank you that you love us so much. We pray this all in Jesus' mm. name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, love. Thank you. Okay, guys. So we've come to the end of our service. Now, in the sermon, I said that at Fellowship City, we're going to take these four things and we're going to start doing them as a church. Because in that way, we'll be a family. And in that way, we can be a family that we can invite people into, right? So look out for some solid teaching. Look out for a lot of spaces for fellowship, smaller groups, social distancing, blah, blah, blah. Look out for some solid eating as much as we possibly can. And look out for some prayer and worship, right? That's what's coming your way in this next couple of weeks. Let me finish us off with a benediction. This benediction comes from the book Ephesians. Ephesians is an important book for our church. And also what Paul teaches in it, let me read it to you guys as a prayer. So being of the family of God asks a new posture of us, new willingness. Herman spoke about that challenge. Paul talks about putting off the old self and dressing yourself with the new self. He says, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Have a blessed Sunday. May you experience the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.